Can we move to questions to the, to the Finance Minister? And once again, we start with oral questions. And Mr. Kelly, uh, number one, is not in his place. And I call Peter Weir. Mr. Weir. Uh, question number two. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for his, for his question. Uh, managing attendance and reducing sick absence remains a key priority within the civil service. I've asked my officials to consider any changes or strategies that may be necessary to ensure that our ministerial targets are met. Mr. Weir, uh, I thank the Minister for his, his detailed response. Uh, can I ask the Minister what specific actions uh, to reduce absence are being considered? Uh, well, I, I, am, I have to say very concerned in the upward trend in sickness absence figures within the civil service, which defies uh, the trend of recent years where it has been going progressively down. Uh, sickness uh, absence went, rose to 10.6 days on, on average uh, in this past year, Mr. Speaker, which is well off our target for, for this particular year. And I am worried that not only have we not met this year's target, but that we are quite a while away from meeting next year's, the current year's target, which is nine days of sickness absence. I'm sure the member of the House will appreciate getting down from 10.6 to 9 is going to be exceptionally challenging. So with that in mind, I've, my officials are considering a, a range of potential actions, including a stress survey and a follow-up action plan, which is planned for early 2014, because uh, stress-related sicknesses account for around 30 per cent of the working days that have been lost. Uh, I've asked for a review of best practice models of attendance management, uh, including the role of the line manager and centralising elements of the process and the support service, also re robust case management for long-term uh, sick. Uh, and I've also asked um, for a refocusing on the management of sick absence policy and procedures to ensure it is managed robustly by departments. Uh, some, say, some people would say that we need to go harder on those who are off uh, on, on the sick. Some say we need to be a bit softer. I think we need a mixture, uh, Mr. Speaker, of a bit of carrot and a bit of st uh, stick in this regard. Uh, so my officials are considering a wide range of options. And whilst my personal preference would be to improve attendance through positive measures such as the prevention of illness and the promotion of a healthier lifestyle, I haven't ruled out any specific options uh, whatsoever. Question number three has been withdrawn and requires a written answer. Dahi McCann. I thank the Minister for his answer, answer so far. Uh, Minister, evidence shows that a healthier workforce is a more productive workforce, uh, and case studies show, show a correlation between walking to work cycling to work and less sick, sick days. In such strands, I say, suggest that by implementing that and focusing on that, we can actually half the number of sick days in terms of the civil service. Can I ask the Minister, uh, does he agree that health and well-being uh, is key to addressing this problem? Uh, and will he introduce, amongst other things, more shower facilities, more bike parking facilities uh, to give employees within the civil service this choice? Uh, and will he also raise the importance of better cycling infrastructure uh, with the Regional Development Minister? I thank the uh, Chair for, for his question, Mr Speaker. I, I, I'm surprised he didn't extol his own virtues as somebody who is now, I think, at least attempting to cycle more to work. Uh, I think it's admirable he's trying to cycle all the way down from, from the Ballymoney area down to, to, to Belfast. He'll be uh, entering the Giro d'Italia if he can sort of keep that up on an ongoing basis. Look, I, I do agree that a healthier workforce is by far the best way to deal with this problem. You know, we can introduce, and I'm prepared to, to recommend to executive colleagues that we introduce a whole range of measures, some um, which are very much focused on employee engagement, some which are maybe looking at the terms and conditions that we have around sickness. Uh, but I would rather not have to do that at all if we can ensure that we do promote a uh, healthier um, workforce and of, obviously um, included within that is walking and cycling to work. Um, the department, and indeed right across the civil service, promotes a cycle to work scheme, which uh, gives uh, financial incentives to uh, members of staff to purchase bikes to cycle to work. And I think we see some of the benefits of that. There could always be more. There could always be more improvements. Uh, I know the member has asked a, a written question uh, lately about sharing facilities within civil service buildings. Um, I think the, the numbers that we have are more encouraging than I thought was the case. Um, but of course, where circumstances would allow, uh, where there is space to do it, where it's appropriate to do it, I would like to see that increased. And of course, where we move into new uh, buildings, and that's something that we are doing in terms of rationalising our estate, it would be one of the criteria, obviously, that we'll be looking at to make sure it was there so that we can encourage more people to cycle to work. Sam Gardner. 
Mr. Speaker, may I ask the Minister what proportion of sickness absence is due to stress or other psychiatric conditions within the civil service? I thank the, the member for, for his question. It is a, it's an important area of consideration. The proportion of working days lost due to psychiatric illnesses such as anxiety, stress, depression and other uh, psychiatric illnesses uh, was 29.8%, so nearly 30% of the total in 2012-2013. Uh, and obviously, you know, as I wanting to be considered as a considered, considered, uh, considerate employer, um, that sort of is a very high level and a cause for concern. And that's where a lot of the focus and a lot of the attention of the measures that uh, we want to see addressed by officials in their review of, 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 of what we do in terms of sickness will focus on those particular areas. Although I, I think it's, it's worth remembering that even though we focus on the member's question and follow-up questions have focused on uh, the amount of sickness that, that does take place, it's worth remembering that over half of all civil servants, and 52.3 per cent, don't take a single sick day all year. And I think that's something that is worth noting and worth remembering whenever we discuss this issue. Alistair Ross. Mr. Ross. As members will be aware, Mr. Speaker, public sector reform is a high priority for me. Going forward, finances will be tight, whilst there will be greater demand for a better informed, growing and ageing uh, population. My agenda is not to shrink public services, but to make better use of the resources we have for the public sector. One of my first actions as Minister was to establish a new public sector reform division to which the member has referred. The Director has been appointed and he is currently identifying a small multidisciplinary team to develop and progress a work programme of activity. This programme is being informed by researching best practice approaches that have merit from other parts of the world. Meanwhile, I, I and uh, senior staff within the Public Sector uh, Reform Division have been um, engaging with an industry, with community and voluntary sector and trade unions, uh, to listen to their views and thoughts on the opportunities for delivering reform in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, arm's length bodies and local councils. I will ensure that the Public Sector Reform Division is a resource that will not only concentrate upon DFP's own activity or those areas where I, as Finance Minister, have lead responsibility for joined up areas, but that it is available to help all ministerial colleagues. By improving public services across the board, everyone will gain and we have the best opportunity to maximise the public resources available to all of our citizens. Alistair Ross. Mr. Ross. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister has made no secret of his desire to see public sector reform, and indeed I've heard him speak passionately about it in a number of different forums. Can I ask him? to highlight to the House um, which organisations, groups or departments he has met with and what kind of reaction he has had from them in terms of his proposals? Thank the member for, for his question, Mr Speaker. I have met with, uh, as I alluded to in the, the, answer, the first answer, a variety of organisations from business, so um, organisations such as the CBI, for example, um, the Chamber of Commerce and indeed others. I have met with uh, trade unions, I have met with ICTU uh, and I met with NIPSA separately. And I've, I've also met with the Northern Ireland Council for Voluntary Action, who hosted a very useful session with uh, about 40 of, of their member organisations uh, just over a week ago. So that's a fairly broad, fairly eclectic bunch of people. And I have to say, the, the response that I have had has been almost universally enthusiastic. Now, obviously, those different groups, Mr. Speaker, will come at this issue from slightly different perspectives. But what is encouraging for me in taking forward? Uh, public sector reform right across Northern Ireland's public sector is that everybody agrees that they want to see a much more efficient and much more effective and indeed an innovative public sector. Now, we may squabble, may disagree from time to time on how that actually uh, happens on the ground, but I am enthused by the fact that everybody is on board with the principle and a conversation has started across Northern Ireland on this issue. But we haven't just focused on Northern Ireland itself. I've met with the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, um, and I've also last week met with the uh, European Commission's DG on Research and Innovation, who are focusing a lot of their work and attention moving forward on the very issue of public sector innovation. And I'm very keen to continue on and follow up from that, that engagement uh, to see what, what Northern Ireland can contribute across the whole of Europe to improving public sector innovation in all member states and all regions. And I think there's an opportunity for Northern Ireland to share what we do well, but also learn from others about, from their experiences too. Pat Sheegan. Uh, the Minister is right uh, about the need to introduce innovation and risk-taking, albeit well thought through risk-taking into the civil service. But does he now recognise that 
Attacking the integrity of the Public Accounts Committee and the Audit Office was the wrong way to go about it. And would he now withdraw those remarks? Well, I don't think I have anything, Mr. Speaker, to withdraw. I don't think I ever attacked the credibility or integrity of anybody in this House during the recent debate on uh, Public Accounts Committee's work for the previous year. I think I did what was my duty and responsibility to highlight where. Well, I, I highlighted, and I highlighted in response to a question from Mr. Dallet, the vice chair of that committee, yesterday, where I do accept that good work is carried out by the Public Accounts Committee, and particularly where they focus not just on value for money, but where they focus on where we in the public sector sometimes fail to achieve the outcomes that we would desire. But what I will not withdraw, and what I will not cease in pointing out to the PAC, because I do believe this has to be. I can't sit here, and executive colleagues can't stand here either, and just take one-way traffic from the PAC all the time. We have, to, we have the right to push back every bit as much as they have the right to come at us. And were some of the comments that are made publicly by the PAC and members of the PAC, which actually does damage to the principle of public sector innovation, where it causes civil servants to think twice about taking a well thought out and carf, uh, carefully considered risk, then I think the work of the PAC is damaging. I think where the PAC goes into the public domain, Mr. Speaker, and says things like that there is a, a sense or an error of corruption about a particular contract without putting into the public domain any evidence whatsoever about that, they, I think, should reflect on whether that is right and proper to do that, to accuse people of being corrupt in the public arena without no, without no comeback from those individuals, and whether, in fact, doing that has a positive or negative effect, impact on the principles of public sector reform, which I think he and I both agree on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for um, his answers thus far. The Minister will know that, that I'm a big fan of his public sector reform ideas. Um, can I ask him how regularly he meets with his <laughs> how, how regularly he meets um, with his executive colleagues to discuss potential opportunities uh, to improve service delivery, and are there some departments who are more willing to engage than others? I'm glad I have one fan. Um, uh, I think that well, like, I, I don't meet. I haven't. I've yet to meet regularly with uh, ministerial colleagues on this particular issue. Uh, although I do hope to meet with them um, on a one-to-one -one basis over the coming months as we progress the 2015-2016 budget and contained within that budget, I want to see that as an opportunity to discuss public sector reform and innovation. I think um, as we look at a public uh, sector. Our public spending environment, which is likely to see contraction, particularly on the uh, current expenditure side, I think it's important that I seek to focus the minds of colleagues on trying to reform their own departments. I think that's an incredibly important opportunity to do that. Um, so, whilst I may have some views on which ministers may be better at engaging than others, given the fact that I haven't, I've yet to engage with them properly, I'm not going to be drawn into any comment uh, whether they're good or good boys or bad boys uh, or otherwise. Phil Flanagan. Mr. Flanagan. The, the member for his question. Officials have liaised as normal with Treasury in providing the necessary information used for the production of the country and regional analysis which Treasury produce on an annual basis. I thank the, the Minister for his deeply informative answer. Um, but can he give me an assurance that, is, that he is scrutinising line by line all lines of expenditure attached to the North through this? Um, analysis, given the continuing delay in publishing that has been attributed to quality, quality assurance issues? Can, I can absolutely. I, it was as carefully considered a question or an answer as it was a question, I would suggest. Uh, I, have, I have carefully, indeed I can confirm, I have carefully considered particularly this report since the member raised it via, via his question. And I have to say, Mr. Speaker, I wouldn't make particularly comfortable reading for somebody of his own political persuasion, because what it shows very, very clearly is that identifiable expenditure contained within this report uh, per head for England, Scotland and Wales was £8.5,000, £10.1,000 and £9.7,000 respectively. Spending per head in Northern Ireland was the highest in the whole of the United Kingdom at £10.9,000. So, you know, it does show that that represents 124% of the UK average. So Mr Flanagan and many of his colleagues bitterly come to this House and say how much better off we would be if we were only to leave the United Kingdom and join in the United Ireland, which is of course in dire financial straits at this minute in time. 
The report that Mr Flanagan's question has helpfully highlighted only goes to show that Northern Ireland is receiving an exceptionally good deal as its membership through its membership of the United Kingdom. So I would encourage the member to carefully consider a report that shows that in Northern Ireland we spend the highest levels in the whole of the UK on education, on social protection, and on agriculture, and in many other areas of public expenditure. So I would encourage the member to read the very report that he has highlighted in his own questions, and I'm sure it will, it will encourage himself to question his own political views. Ian McRae. Mr McRae. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And there's certainly no doubt that if, if the report the Minister refers to um, reassures our, our connection with the, the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, I think the members across could learn from that. Um, can the Minister maybe outline how we compare Northern Ireland to other regions um, within the United Kingdom, Scotland and Wales? I, I, I agree with the member. I hope that the members opposite do indeed learn from, from the report. Um, I suspect that they won't. Um, even when it is presented evidentially in black and white in front of them, I suspect they won't, uh, won't reach an objective conclusion in respect of it. Uh, as I pointed out in response to the member op opposite, the report makes favourable reading for Northern Ireland. In some, way, look, in some ways, I, I'm not proud of the fact that we are so dependent as we are on other taxpayers in the United Kingdom for the, um, the lifestyles and, and the public expenditure that we have in, in Northern Ireland. That's something that I would like to see as we grow our economy and our economy improves, that we will close that gap over time and that we will not be as dependent on taxpayers elsewhere in the United Kingdom um, for public expenditure here. But as it currently stands, I think what we see is that from this report, the fact that in Northern Ireland we have £10,900 spent per head of the population compared to the lowest figure, which is eight, eight and a half thousand in England, shows that Northern Ireland's people are getting an exceptionally good deal out of their membership of the United Kingdom. Bottle McRae. Mr McRae. Question number six, Mr Speaker. Thank the member for his question, Mr. Speaker. The Building a Prosperous and United Community document commits us to examining the potential for devolving additional fiscal powers by autumn 2014. And as part of this, we are currently examining the Calman and Silk Commission's reports. As all produced similar findings, a full commission to consider the devolution of fiscal powers to Northern Ireland may not be justified. The most important consideration for us at the moment is the devolution of corporation tax. Clearly, we want to draw on these but I do not want to unduly delay this work either. The Economic Pact commitment is to put recommendations to executive and government ministers by autumn 2014, and I want to achieve that. Therefore, there are no plans at this stage to establish a commission for Northern Ireland. Bottle McRae. Mr McRae. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that after the Scottish referendum, when I am quite confident that Scotland will vote to remain a part of the United Kingdom, that it is likely that there will be further examination of the devolution of fiscal powers to both the Scottish and Welsh uh, uh, regions. Would he not accept that Northern Ireland will be at a disadvantage when such discussions take place because we do not have a Commission having looked at all of the possibilities? I, I don't accept that we would be at a, at a disadvantage, and I, you know, I hope that um, the member is right in his conclusion in respect of. Uh, the Scottish referendum, not least because I think that the result that he and I would both want to see happen um, will, will hasten, I hope, uh, devolution of corporation tax in Northern Ireland, which would be, I have to say, an exceptionally large undertaking for this administration to go forward with. We have, ha we have already had devolution of our passenger duty for long, direct long-haul flights, which I think is an important thing to note, because that is something that both Wales and Scotland would be very envious of and, and wanted and have requested from Treasury but have been turned down. So in some ways, if the member and I were sitting in a different administration, perhaps in, in Edinburgh or in Cardiff, um, we may be sort of asking the question, are we at a disadvantage to Northern Ireland because they have uh, direct um, or APD um, devolution of the APD for direct long haul flights. So you know I think what is happening right across the United Kingdom as devolution embeds across the UK is that different parts of the United Kingdom that are different of all regions will seek different, the devolution of different tax powers to suit their own particular objectives. We are pursuing, and it's not that I am against or the executive is against pursuing the devolution of certain tax powers. We've already secured APD, as I've said, and we are vigorously pursuing corporation tax, which, as we all know, would have a transformative effect on our economy. But we do so where there is a clear economic benefit for Northern Ireland. Some of the taxes that have been devolved in Scotland are to, or are to be devolved in Scotland, and that Wales are also now seeking devolution of. I don't think 
give them an economic advantage over Northern Ireland. In fact, I, I fail to see where a huge transformative economic advantage would come from having landfill tax or indeed stamp duty. And that's not to disregard those taxes and say that we wouldn't consider devolving them ourselves. But I actually think that those regions, and certainly in discussions with ministers in those regions, they are quite envious of what we have and what we are pursuing in terms of corporation tax. Rosalind McCurley. I thank the Minister for his answers up to now. Um, uh, given that the, the Scottish tax forecast was published for the first time last year, would the Minister not agree that he should be arguing for more accurate tax forecasts so that we can have more informed economic decision making? Yeah. The, the HMRC recently also published its estimates of uh, taxes. Um, uh, on what each region was contributing via taxes. And again, much like Mr. Flanagan's question, it doesn't make entirely uh, pretty reading um, for Northern Ireland, and it shows that we are um, in, in receipt of quite a large subvention within the United Kingdom, which the, the member will know, and it sits at uh, £10.5 billion pounds at, at current figures, which is a huge amount of money for us to receive. Um, look, I, I think that, it, of course, it would be better if we had much more accurate figures about what we raise in tax. It certainly would help us uh, in our ongoing discussions in respect of corporation tax if we were to be able to hollow out precisely what the price is in terms of what we raise and what it will cost the Exchequer to devolve those powers to Northern Ireland. But I think by its very nature and the type of state that we have, um, it is hard to get a precise figure on what taxes are raised in Northern Ireland versus what are raised in Scotland or what are raised in Wales and what are raised in other regions of the United Kingdom. Um, but you know, there are figures there which, are, which do marry up. And if you look at the HMRC's report versus our own net fiscal balance report, there are a lot of similarities which show that we are using, by using similar methodologies, we are getting more or less the right answer. Fergal McKinney. Uh, I, I wouldn't be as confident as uh, Mr. McRae appears to be in relation to reading the Scottish public mind in relation to devolution. Can I thank the Minister? And uh, what aspects of the powers identified by the, the Silk and Calman Commissions he would consider for devolution uh, to Northern Ireland? Thank you. Well, rather than, rather than a member joining with a soothsayer in the far corner and, and reading into what the Scottish electorate might think, I think listening to recent reports, it might be better if the member and his colleagues actually started to think about what the national electorate in Northern Ireland were thinking. That might be more beneficial for him. That might be more beneficial for him and his party in the, the short term. Um, look, I, 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 come at, I come at the issues that, uh, in terms of the taxes that we are considering. Uh, with a fairly open mind, I have to say, you know, I, I think that there are there are considerable issues with many of the taxes that we may get if we went and requested them from Treasury. You know, if you take income tax, for example, the HMRC report that I referred to in, the, in response to the previous member showed that Northern Ireland uh, raises about three and a half billion pounds in income tax every year. Now, if we were to devolve that, then it, it begs the question: Do you want to put that level up? Do you want to take that level down? And there are consequences in terms of cost for both. If you put, put them up, then people are going to have to pay for it. If you bring them down, it means less money for public services. And even if you kept it static, um, there is going to be administration costs, just in the same way as there are with corporation tax. And there also is the, the fluctuation cost in that you, would, you are dependent on what the take is in any particular year. And over the last couple of years, we have seen the tax take, according to the HMRC on income tax, go down by 200 million in Northern Ireland. So, that would be 200 million that instead of us getting through subvention that we get in the block grant, we would have to meet out of our own budget. So there are considerations like that. I mean, it might superficially sometimes look like something that's attractive. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, in response to Mr. McRae issues about um, landfill tax and stamp duty. I think there may be things that we would be able to do that are good for policy as a result of devolving that. But whether the, those two or income tax would have the sort of transformative effect that corporation would ha tax would have on our economy, I seriously doubt it. So that's why I, I would argue that we should be focused first and foremost on that number one priority, which is to see corporation tax devolved in Northern Ireland, and let us ensure that we can do that and then we can deliver on that, and then we can look at other options uh, following on from it. Robin Newton, Mr. Newton. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for I mean, the, the very articulate way in which he has dealt with all of this, this question? But it is a question obviously that, that is um, arousing interest in this assembly and indeed elsewhere. But could he be quite specific as to why we aren't pressing the government to be treated in exactly the same way as Scotland and Wales on this matter? 
member for his question, Mr. Speaker. And look, I, I think it's a, you know, I, I'm more than happy to have the debate about whether we should devolve additional tax powers to the Stormont Assembly, whether, what powers we should devolve. I think it's a conversation that we should have, and it shows a, perhaps a sign of our growing maturity as an institution that we are prepared to consider additional tax devolution powers coming to, to, to this institution. Um, but I think we have to do so in a very open, open way. Um, and that we have to consider that sometimes, as I said in reply to the previous member, superficially it can look attractive, but in reality, when you bear into it, it's not the best idea for Northern Ireland, given the financial position that we, we find ourselves in. So, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to have the discussion, um, but I think we have to do it. We have to have an approach what powers we would consider to devolve Northern Ireland on the basis of some principles. And for me, the for foremost principle is that it is of economic benefit to Northern Ireland. So our passenger duty, we didn't perhaps in itself want to see that tax devolved, but it was a means to ensure that we kept the direct flight in and out from Belfast to, to New York. Um, and that devolving that power was the way in which we kept that. Corporation tax, as I mentioned before, is something that we're pursuing because we can see the long-term economic benefit that there is for Northern Ireland. And some might want to see other powers devolved, perhaps for political reasons or accountability reasons. That's why I think the Scottish Government in particular are pursuing a lot of these powers, because it, it suits their political agenda. It doesn't necessarily suit uh, the fiscal situation in Scotland, or it doesn't necessarily suit the economy in Scotland. It's something that they want to do politically. I think we've got to be very clear that we will consider any and all taxes to be devolved to this Assembly if they produce an economic benefit and are, of course, affordable to this Assembly and the people we serve. Paul Gibbon. Mr. Gibbon. Question number seven, Mr. Speaker. Thank the, the member for, for his question, Mr. Speaker. The addendum to the business case was formally approved by my department on the 26th of November of this year. The tender process will now be completed and a preferred bidder appointed. It is expected that construction of the new Community Safety College at Desert Creek will commence in the new year. The delivery of this new police, fire and prison training college is a key programme for government commitment, and this investment will deliver a world-class training facility for these essential public services which have suffered from underinvestment by direct rural ministers. Paul Gibbon. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that announcement? Um, obviously, this has been a project that um, we have been pursuing for a long period of time and has been bedeviled by delays, but uh, finally uh, the Minister has obviously been able to announce that uh, progress has been made. Uh, in terms of Her Majesty Treasury funding, how much is tied up in this project and when does that need to be paid for? I thank the member for, for his follow-up, Mr Speaker. I'm very, very glad that we're uh, able to, to announce that we have been able to make progress on this scheme. Uh, it is a, uh, what is proposed is a, a, and the member will know through his, his chairmanship of the Justice Committee, it is a world-class facility and it will be a facility that, that I'm absolutely certain that, that uh, police forces and fire services from around the world will want to come and visit and use uh, as a facility to, to train their own staff in. Uh, he is right to raise uh, the issue about uh, Her Majesty's Treasury funding. Uh, under the devolution of policing and justice settlement, Her Majesty's Treasury provided some £70.3 million, which is in a ring-fenced fund for the Northern Ireland Community Safety College. The Department of Justice currently enjoys end-year flexibility for these funds and will continue to do, do so until the end of this budget period in 2015. It is my understanding though, that if these funds are not utilised by April 2015, then there is a possibility that some of this ring fence element may be lost to the Treasury. I have agreed with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury that we will continue to closely monitor the delivery of this project, but the message I want to send to, to the Department of Justice is that they need to proceed post haste. I appreciate that there have been delays, not all of them are making by any means whatsoever, but they do need to ensure that in order to, to access that £70.3 million of funding that is ring fenced and set aside for this project, that they need to um, proceed post haste with this project. Could I ask the Minister, uh, is there any provision within the contracts for social clauses similar to those in the Stadium Development Programme uh, by DECAL? There, I mean, there, there isn't a contract in, in place yet. The, the tender process was paused because of the, the cost overrun, as it were. The, the, estimate, the estimated cost was at one level and the prices that came in were substantially higher. Those, those costs have been reduced through the, the bill of, uh, of reductions exercise that has taken, taken place. So it's reduced the, the construction cost by some £25 million. The executive, as a member will know, is, is committed to ensuring that there are social clauses in all contracts, not just construction contracts, but all contracts moving forward. And I would fully expect that this contract, like all other contracts, will include social clauses which will 
not exclusively, but particularly concentrate, given that they are construction in nature, on long-term unemployed and, and creating apprenticeships. Order members, that concludes all questions uh, to the Minister. We now move to topical questions. Question number two has been withdrawn. Raymond McCartney. Mr McCartney. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister if he's had any discussions with the Ulster Bank in, in light of the, the recent sort of uh, glitches in their, their IT machines and what was the outcome of those discussions and did, did he receive any reassurances? Yeah, I, I thank the member for, for a question, a very, very topical question, probably the first topical question I've had um, and topical questions even though this is my fourth go at it. Um, yes, I have had, I've had discussions as soon as I became aware that there were problems developing last night and the customers were expressing concern that they couldn't make payments and that they couldn't access their own money out of cash machines and the embarrassment that it was causing some of them in stores when they couldn't pay or whenever they needed perhaps emergency access to their own cash from a hole in the wall, they couldn't get it. Um, I made contact and made communication, had communication overnight and early this morning with Ulster Bank. I have this afternoon uh, spoken on the telephone to Stephen Cruz, who is the head of retail banking in, in the Ulster Bank. And I think you know, they, they accept and they understand that this is being bad news for, for their customers. It is the third time uh, that such an incident has happened, albeit not as bad as the one back in June, I think it was, of 2012. I think we can see some solace and some reassurance in the fact that they have. It is not, I am told, it is not the same IT issue. I'm not, not sure whether that is something to seek solace from, but it is not the same problem, so therefore one wouldn't expect the reoccurrence and, and the longevity of the last problem. I am informed that all problems have now been overcome and that, um, you know, that the, um, yes, and the problem as arose last evening now just seems to be fixed, although there are some indications in RBS across the water that some problems do still exist. Uh, other banks have had similar issues, I know, but this is, of course, the third time at Ulster Bank have promised it, and I don't think they need me to tell them that it does cause some debt damage to their reputation um, and it causes some concern for their customers. I, I have sought some assurances insofar as I can that this sort of uh, incident doesn't happen again, but you know, you're dealing with IT systems and who knows what, what sometimes can happen to it. Again, I seek some solace in the fact that they um, have assured me that RBS continue to invest quite he heavily in its IT systems because they appreciate and realise that this is causing them some, some difficulties as, an, as a bank. Mr. Kids Vegas Lechonera. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his comprehensive answer? You know, given that, I mean, and the Minister himself has said this that, the, that this is perhaps happening all too frequently. You know, could part of the discussions, and would the Minister agree that part of the discussion has to be a decoupling of the Ulster Bank IT systems from the Royal Bank of Scotland to protect ourselves here? The, look, I mean, that, that's, that's an operational matter that would be have to be considered by, by Ulster Bank in the context of its, its ownership by RBS Group. I would imagine that decoupling it would come at a considerable cost to Ulster Bank, and I would be worried that even though in some ways it might seem like the right thing to do, it might come as a, you know, with a great price tag, a huge price tag to, to customers here in Northern Ireland who would ultimately have to, to pay for, for, for something like that. But look, I, I, you know, I think I, I will continue to press on the basis that I have no authority or say over what the banks do at all, but continue to press them. Look, they're, the Ulster Bank, and we've, we've recognised this previously in this House, are of critical importance to the banking system in Northern Ireland and ergo critical importance to the economy in Northern Ireland. And it is important that their customers can access the fund, their funds when they need to access their funds. Uh, I am assured as well by the bank that anybody who has been out of pocket as a result of this latest problem will be reimbursed. Anybody who continues to experience problems of any kind should either call into their local branch or contact on the telephone. Ulster Bank's call centre. And I am worried about one other aspect, which I think is worth reiterating in this House, uh, in case anybody is listening, is that some criminals would appear to be trying to capitalise on this and are issuing phishing emails to Ulster Bank customers saying that because of the system crash that they should re-enter their account details and all of that. So it would be a terrible shame if people, having lost out, you know, having had the embarrassment, maybe have not been able to make a payment, then fall foul of some criminal activity as well. So I would just use this opportunity to try to reiterate to the general public not to fall for that. The bank themselves will not be asking anybody for their, their PIN number or their bank account details or anything like that online. Allegheny. Can I 
ask uh, the Minister what measures he can take to prevent the Executive's 2003 and 14 allocation of financial transaction capital being surrendered back to Her Majesty's Government. I thank, the, thank the member for, for the question. Over, over recent months, I have, uh, along with my Scottish and Welsh counterparts, uh, lobbied the Chief Secretary to the Treasury for end year flexibility in respect of financial transactions capital, which is the, the member in the House will know is um, a new device which the, the government are bringing forward to try to increase spending on capital projects in the private sector. Uh, I am pleased, though, to confirm that such a scheme has now been agreed amongst Treasury and the devolved administrations. This scheme will allow the Northern Ireland Executive flexibility to carry forward unspent financial transactions capital funding across each of the next two financial years. This flexibility amounts to 20% carry forward of unused financial transactions capital funding into 2014-15 and 10% into 15-16. This will ensure that we have more time to develop suitable schemes and will significantly reduce the risk of any funding being surrendered to Her Majesty's Treasury. Um, could I ask uh, the Minister what is the position for Scotland and Wales? Scotland and Wales will also receive, receive the same flexibilities that, that we in Northern Ireland receive. So they will receive 20% um, carryover in the first year and 10% carryover in the second year. I'm not sure what that is as it represents in terms of their total of expenditure, but in terms of Northern Ireland, I can, can inform the House that um, we've, we've, um, this year we will be able to carry forward into next year some £9.4 million, pounds, and next year we will be able to carry forward into 15, 16, £5.4 million. Pounds. I have been encouraged by the engagement that I have had with uh, other departments and that my officials have had with other departments, and, and departments are now starting coming forward with some exceptionally good schemes that would use up financial transactions capital. So I would be optimistic that we won't have to use all of that carry forward, but it is a useful device to have nonetheless in case we do hit a situation where because they're very demand-led, these schemes, one of them maybe can't move forward, and we're, we need to have that flexibility, or else we would, would possibly lo lose it back to Treasury, and that's not something that, that I or anybody in this House wants to see happen. Question number four, Mr Kelly's not misplaced. Katrina Rahn. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd also like to thank ministers for, uh, for his answers to date. The question I have is about the Narrow Water Bridge, um, and I wonder would the minister agree with me that uh, the construction of this bridge will create badly needed jobs in terms of tourism and construction? I wonder would he agree with me in relation to that? I, I, I'm disappointed. I'm as Perhaps not as disappointed as a member, given that she represents a constituency, but I'm disappointed that this scheme hasn't been able to go forward, Mr. Speaker. Um, and, and certainly listening to representatives from the area who are in this House, and indeed listening to, to others from that area, there was a great belief that the construction of this bridge um, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't only just you know, improve connectivity, which was important, but would provide a boost to, to tourism on both sides of the border. So in that respect, it is disappointing that the scheme isn't going, going ahead. Um, I am now in the position alongside my counterpart in the Irish Republic with having roughly £17 million pounds worth of EU funding unspent. Uh, it is important now that we get that money spent, and that now is my priority. As disappointing as it will be for the member and people in that area that, that scheme isn't, the Narrow Water Bridge scheme isn't going forward, um, Northern Ireland and indeed the Republic of Ireland do now make sure that we get the money that we have from Europe spent on a project. Can I urge the Minister? Um, the best way of spending the money is by liaising with the southern counterparts to ensure that the project does go ahead. And I'm surprised to hear uh, that he doesn't believe that it will go ahead, because with the right political will, uh, there is, it can go ahead. And can the minister uh, let me know what he has done and his department to ensure that the project does go ahead rather than lose money um, to this important project? The unfortunate reality for, for, the, for the member, indeed for the, the project, is that the letter of offer issued by the SEUPB has now been withdrawn. So that the scheme has, is off the table in that regard. And our priority now is to ensure that the EU funding that is available to us is spent. Uh, I was in Brussels uh, early last week. Uh, spoke to officials from the senior officials from the DG Regio who deal with um, um, indirect funding and peace funding. And it was very, the message that came very, very clearly from them was that the impression that it would give if Northern Ireland was unable to spend this money um, whenever we have sought and received a, an extension of peace funding into a, a fourth strand 
wouldn't be a good impression if we weren't able to spend it. So my priority now is, whilst it may be disappointing for, for members that the narrow water bridge scheme isn't going forward, my priority and the priority of my counterparts in the Irish Republic was to ensure that the money that is available to us is spent on a project which is equally worthwhile and, and improves infrastructure um, on a cross-border basis. Phil Flanagan. Mr. Flanagan. Um, the Minister will be aware of HMRC's plans to, to close service here and, and reduce um, a significant quantity of jobs. Can the Minister give us an update with any discussions he's had with HMRC about trying to retain those jobs locally? I'm very concerned. I, I think some of the, the jobs are located in Enniskillen in the members' constituency, so we'll have a particular concern about it. None are located in my constituency, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that some of the people working in Belfast and Dorchester House will be employed, or will be from, from all parts of, of the province. So it is deeply concerning that uh, HMRC are coming forward with these plans to uh, make quite a, quite a few hundred people potentially uh, redundant in Northern Ireland. Um, my officials are discussing they say have, have discussed and will continue to discuss this issue with their counterparts in HMRC. I am due to meet Treasury Ministers actually tomorrow, and it is something that I may be able to raise with them in the margins of that meeting, which is actually about banking, first and foremost. Phil Flanagan. I thank the Minister for his response. It will be interesting to be a fly on the wall at this meeting when he discusses banking and HMRC. Um, can, can the Minister give us an assurance that, that he and the, his executive colleagues will do everything in their power um, to try and retain these jobs locally and, and, and particularly engage in discussions with HMRC to see if any of those services that are, are being transferred um, into Britain could actually be delivered better using the existing first-class services that are on offer here? Yeah, look, absolutely. The member can have an absolute assurance that myself and colleagues will do, make uh, every effort that we possibly can to retain all of those jobs in the way that we have fought hard to ensure that the DVA jobs are retained in, in coal rain. I know that my executive colleague, the Minister for Enterprise, Arnie Foster, is, is particularly taking forward this issue, not least because she has the same constituency interest that the, the member has. Uh, and I think we can, as we did uh, DVA, and I think we can do in HMRC as well, make a robust case. Uh, to HMRC that actually retaining, whilst the, the nature of the job that the people who are employed in HMRC in Northern Ireland do may change as a result of changes that HMRC are going through, that they do represent a good value for money solution to some of the problems that they have and some of the, the cost-cutting measures that they will have to introduce. We have done that with uh, child maintenance, we have done that with social security where we have bid for and won and secured um, repetitively big contracts to provide services back into England. I think we can do likewise for DVA, and I think we can do likewise as well, Mr Speaker, for HMRC too. Jim Allister. Mr uh, Minister, under EU regulations, there is a requirement for actual additionality in regard to funding under regional and social funding. Is the Minister satisfied that in a devolutionary arrangement, there is indeed transparent additionality of EU funds? Well, it is a good, it's a good question that the member asks, and I, you know, I, I, I think it is something that perhaps we don't measure as clearly as we might want to measure, uh, and it's something that I'm happy to take away and speak to the officials on how precisely we measure and ensure that there is additionality, um, because as the member is right to point out, it is, it is imperative that if we are getting this money that we are getting something additional for it, and that it is adding value to Northern Ireland and rather than just a redistribution of cash that we might have got anyway from, from Treasury. Mr. I, I welcome the fact that the Minister will do that, and I suggest he conducts a very st a severe audit on it, because certainly I had correspondence some years ago from his department, long before his time, which left one with a very distinct impression that there was anything but transparency and a severe question mark over where or not there is actual additionality. And I think it is something that a devolved institution could well be missing out on very substantially. I know the member and I would agree, or agree in our disagreements with many things that the European Union does, and you know, we could, I don't have the time to go through all of that. Um, but you know, what I've always been very, very clear on is that we get as much of our own money back into Northern Ireland to spend on projects that are beneficial to Northern Ireland. So in that respect, I agree with the member as well that we need to have genuine additionality for what we are spending. And you know, without having um, particularly consulted at it in my term in office, I'm happy to, to pick up the issue and correspond back to the member on what I find. Order members, that concludes question time for today. Mr.